Amen. Our second reading is a powerful reading, and it's coming out of the gospel according to Luke, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And there it is recorded. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph out of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing is impossible with God. And then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. The word of God for the people of God. You might think of this as being a Christmas story or a scripture that's applied during the Christmas season. And it is. It's that and more. And today God has taken us in another place and he's given me to highlight that particular writing. And he knows what he's doing. We don't know what God's doing. But he knows what he's doing, and he's made no mistakes. What does it mean to be called by God? What does it mean to be called by God? The Bible often mentions people being called by God for a specific ministry or service. Paul was called by God. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The transformed Paul. And the Old Testament priests were called by God for their special work. To be called by God is to be chosen by God for a certain purpose, for his mission, for his glory. And when a person is aware of that call and surrenders to it, He or she starts living out God's purpose. And just like we sang that song, maybe we may not have ever sung it before. But just the fact that you confessed it, the song, is like reading the song. And as you confess it verbally or with melody, it's still a confession. But only you know if you mean it. Only you know if the words apply to you. God called the entire nation of Israel to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He called a whole nation. It was the church redeemed by the blood of Jesus is likewise called. That's where we are today. We have made them to be a kingdom of priests and to serve our God. That's what we're doing in this generation. We're made to be priests. That makes sense to you? Talk it over with God. But if you're going to believe him, believe all of him. And if he's given us to be a priest, we have assignments. He's called us to be a holy nation as well. God's calling of Israel was to showcase God's salvation to the pagan world. They never flourished in the way God wanted them to prosper. They kept 
falling along the way and picking up idols in the process of their captivity. And we can be captured. We can be taken captive. We can be captured by lack of finances, unemployment, sickness, Whatever it is, whatever it may possibly be, we still have to follow the rules and not tilt to the left or tilt to the right. His call now is to all those who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus to showcase to our world today God's mercy, his grace, and his salvation. That's what he does now. Through us, he shows the world God's mercy, grace, and salvation through us. God is far more involved with this universe than we can imagine. Even though he's given humankind the freedom to make choices, his choice has already been made for us. We can embrace it or we can resist it. He calls all that he makes, you know that. He makes all to be called. But he says, many are called, but few are chosen. There, there are some that just don't want that part of God. They want to put it off. He's not that important to them yet. They haven't arrived at that place yet. They want to spend a little bit more time doing what makes them feel good and makes them happy. We are called by God to salvation. In fact, we are a called out assembly of believers. The call to salvation involves conforming us to the image of his son. We should be looking like Christ about now. We've been in church long enough and hopefully heard the sermons to a great length that we can honestly say that we have practiced Christianity and it matters to us. It matters because we're called to salvation. It means conforming us to the image of his son. Do we look like Jesus? Do we? Do we look like Jesus? Think about it. Do you really know this man called Jesus, the one who died for us? He's awfully good. His election to call to salvation are part of an eternal plan for us that guarantees our inheritance in heaven. And, and those he predestined, he preordained us. He foreordained, he appointed us. He also called us. And those that he called, he also justified. And those that he justified, he also glorified. He has authorized us to be priests, to be the likeness of Christ. What an honor that is. How many people wear it proudly and declare it out loud? The title of the message is Your Attention, Please. Your Attention, Please. After salvation, we are further called to grow in Christian virtue and serve God by good works. In fact, it is this growth and the development process that confirms our calling by God. If we've been in church 20, 30, 40, 50 years and we haven't grown in the likeness of Christ, I don't mean in positions. I don't mean in the size of the building and the renovation. I don't, that, that's neither here nor there. But if you've been at it and you've been practicing, and practice makes perfect, then we should look like Christ, talk like him, think like him, 
serve like him by now. By now. And if we're behind the eight ball and we've been dragging up in the back of the field and we're not giving God our best, when do you plan to step on the accelerator? How do you know God is calling you? Well, if you look out your window and you see uh, enough young people just hanging out all day and they don't know where their mother is, you might have a, a concern in your heart like, I, I think I want to, I don't know where the mother is. I never see her, but once in a while, I, I hope those babies aren't over there by themselves. You begin, to, you begin to have something going on in you called compassion, concern. And, and if you listen to God long enough, because you start talking to him, because like I say, you can't not help but talk to God all day. Because life will make you talk to him all day. If you're not asking him for something, you're saying, thank you for giving it to me. <laughs> Whatever it might be. But we should have, when something's tugging at your heart like that, that's God. When something good is coming inside of your mind and your heart, it comes from God. Act on it. He's calling you to do an assignment. What can I do? I don't want to get involved in people's business. Well, it wouldn't hurt to, to avail yourself. It wouldn't, it would not hurt to avail yourself. <coughs> it wouldn't hurt to call somebody over. And all you have to do is what God tells you to do. God may tell you to give, give them an envelope with $20. Maybe give them an envelope with $50. Now, I know God's not going to tell you to ask them, or do they do drugs? He's not going to tell you to do that. But if you see somebody, like son and daughter out there, and you are compelled, you see them at the gas tank, and it seems they just don't have enough. They're like searching their pockets. They're like, oh, boy, I left my money home. Don't you have some compassion there? You don't have to open your purse all up and show them all your hundreds. <laughs> but just slide out a 20 or so. Or go inside better yet and say, out on that pump, that young man, I'm giving you a 20 for his gas. That's God calling us. There's so many things that we can do. He called Jonah. You know the story with Jonah. Jonah didn't want to go. He was prejudiced. He thought that the... Those people should die. They should burn by the state. He was heartless. And so God had to get a fish for Jonah to bring him back to where he was supposed to be. At least he didn't have to pay for that ride. <laughs> but it was bumpy. It was rough. <laughs> Being in the belly of a fish upside down, flipping around and carrying on. Yeah, that's a rough ride. But he didn't have to pay for it. When he came out of that fish's belly, he did what God say do. If you feel something tugging at you, at your heart and in your conscience, that's God. He's telling you to do something good, do it. If he says just go to a nursing home, spend an hour there, pray for three people, do it. Doesn't make sense, does it? No, that it's not for to make sense to you is to glorify God. Somebody's waiting to hear from us because we are what? The image of Christ. If we don't take Christ to some people, they'll never see him. So this morning we're talking about Moses and the burning bush and, and David read about that scripture. And we know that Moses uh, was born a slave. He was born at the time of population control. The King Pharaoh thought, it's just too many boy babies and we're not having any more boy babies for a few years. Any babies from birth to two, throw them in the river. That was the law. And you know the story. Moses' mother was wise enough to make a, a basket for her baby and she pushed him on the stream of success and victory and freedom. She didn't know it but she knew enough about her God that knew he was capable 
And he grew up, Moses grew up at the palace. When he reached about 25 year, years old, he killed an Egyptian. And he ran then for another 55 years as a fugitive. That's a long time. But when he was 80, one day he was up and about. He had become a shepherd, one of the lowest positions in society of that day and still today. But all of a sudden, as he's out there in the glazing area, he sees a bush, a bush in a grazing area. That doesn't even go together. A bush in a grazing area. He's taking the sheep to where sheep eat, and that's a grazing area grassy area, and bushes don't grow there. So all of a sudden, he sees this burning bush, and he's 80 years old, mind you. And he says, this is just so out of nature. We're in a desert, and let me go over and, and check this. And he gets closer. You know, sometimes God calls us, and he'll make us get closer. He'll put an attraction there. Your attention, please, is what he's saying. And he comes over and he notices that the bush is burning and it's not being consumed. And he looks and he doesn't see a, a burner under it. He doesn't see a grill under it. And then all of a sudden a voice comes out of those flames. Your attention, please. It's what God is saying. He's saying that to the whole world. Your attention, please. Because we're so busy hurrying about who we think we are. It's just a month ago, it was the flames on the West Coast in California. Before that, it was the floods. Before that, now the hurricanes and the typhoons. And you're saying that's always happening. Well, then we had the pandemic thrown in the middle. God is saying, your attention, please. You've gone to school and your teacher sees you all busy around. She walks into the class and she says, your attention, please. What she's saying or what he's saying is forget everything else. Eyes front. I'm the center of attraction here. Pay attention. And this is what God is saying to us. Moses goes over and God talks to Moses. And he tells him the dilemma that he sees. He says, I've heard the cry of my people. They're in bondage. I've heard the cry of my people. You will go and deliver them. You will be a me manifested as them. Go. I will equip you. And Moses tries everything he can to get out of this assignment, just like Jonah. He said, hold up. This is not what I want to do. I'm not the one to sin. I, I have a speech impediment. I have a speech problem. And God said, don't you know I'm the one that made your tongue? Don't you think I know which problems you have? You don't tell me. I'm telling you. I'm God. So just for that, we'll just throw... Aaron in the mix, and Aaron can do the talking, but you're going to go. But I killed a man. Yeah, well, that Pharaoh has died on. They probably wipe your records out of the computer. But you're going because I want you to go. And he gives him a rod. That's not very much to work with, is it? A rod. But a rod with the power of God in it is mighty. The rod, a, a stick a part of a branch from a tree that's been trimmed with a knife is greater than an army with God. And when he tells us to do something, we should be insistent on following through, knowing that he's got us. He's equipped us. He's prepared us. He's already said that. He shed his blood for us. He died that we might live. Why aren't we doing just that? Rather than scuffing along through life, just trying to get by. Whining and complaining as you go. Your attention, please. 
Your attention is what God is wanting. He wants our attention. And we know the story of Moses. He goes through the assignment given him, and he comes out all right. Of course, God had to kind of discipline him a couple of times along the journey. But nevertheless, he didn't get to the promised land because he became a little restless. But he did what God asked him to do in bringing out all those millions of people who were bound. And they wanted to stone him a few times and would have had God not intervened. They would have destroyed their leader. If you think this nation is bad, there's always been a bad nation. But there's never been a bad nation that got past God. There are four ways God gets our attention. First of all, he might disrupt some things. We might want to move out, and he'll just reorchestrate that. They close that job down in that place, and you can stay home. You can stay in Virginia. Oh, you're so disappointed because you've packed up everything, and now the rules have been changed. He gets our attention through restlessness. Sometimes you just can't sleep when God has something for you to do. You have to call on him to get a good night's sleep. Sometimes you hear voices, you hear him speaking to you, and you don't want to hear it because you don't want to do it. He spoke to Samuel. He does unusual blessings just to let you know that you're the one he's targeting. It's like when he fed Elijah out in the wilderness with ravens. Ravens are flesh-eating birds. They don't deliver meat. They devour meat. But when God's in it, they were a cuisine from the sky. They flew in every day and every evening, bringing him delicacy from heaven. God makes no mistakes. He tells us today, loud and clear, your attention, please. And God is a gentleman. He does ask, please. He does. And as we look over into the second reading, we find that there's a little girl named Mary. And Mary's about 13, 14 years old, and she's engaged to Joseph, and you know that story. But today God is saying that, your attention, please. Now, we know that with Moses there was resistance, but with Mary it was a total opposite. She was frightened, she was startled, this was a new new a new experience for her, an angel to show up in her presence. But he laid it all out. God has found favor in you. There was no particulars as to why or how God found the favor, and that's not even necessary. If God sees favor in us, we can say, thank you, because it's none of me. I thank you for your favor. Apparently, she knew the word of God. And Moses knew the word of God. His mother held him in her arms and taught him everything about his nation and his God from, the, from birth to the age of five when they weaned him. He was weaned at five, roughly. That's what they did in that day. So then she was no longer needed to be his nurse. And from that age of five until 25, Moses was placed in the hands of the Egyptians and educated and lived their lifestyle, and he was considered a prince for 25 years. But he had enough of God in him. He had enough of the story. He had enough impact by his mother that he never forgot. So now we have Mary, 14-year-old, and she's from a family of, of preachers from a Levite. So she knows the way. She knows about God. She's young. She's innocent. And God loves the young people. He says, let the children come to me. For blessed are the children. Because they're innocent. They haven't learned all the garbage and ugly stuff we do. 
They're innocent. They're pure. They're precious. And God looked upon this young lady, Mary, and she was in a lowly version, in a low-income dwelling, the rough side of town. And God goes there and handpicks her. And he sends an angel to give her an assignment. And all she wants to know is, how is this going to be? Because I know not a man. And he told her, the Holy Spirit shall overshadow you. Now, that's over my head. I'm sure it was over Mary's head. She said, well, let that which you desire of me be done. Unlike Moses, who was trying to skip around it, trying to get past it, trying to get away from it. Your attention, please. There's nothing too hard for God. No thing is too hard. If he says it, he'll do it. Do we believe it? Do we trust him to use us to the max? Do we ask him to fill us with the Holy Spirit until it spills? Do we ever say, God, use me until you use me up? Or are we just having little casual religious encounters when we come to church? This is just a social place. God says, your attention, please. Pay attention to me, saith the Lord thy God. He lets us know that he's calling us sometimes when we're defeated. Things just don't go our way. He's calling us. Sometimes we have to lose possessions, houses and land. Some people who were never in the flood never called on God, but when that flood started rolling down their streets and they saw homes and parts of cars, they began to call on God. It was worth them losing those possessions to meet him and to embrace him. And tragedies are another way that God gets our undivided attention. Some of these mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers would never have attended church, would never have known the opportunity to hear a voice of God speak to them had they not experienced a tragic in their life, a horrible tragic. The violence, the shootings in the streets, Many young people who are in schools and they have to deal with these, these outbreaks are learning to pray. And I do wish that the grandparents were, were embracing them even the more and teaching them how to pray and what to pray for so that they can intercede for others when they walk through the corridors at school. They need to know how to pray. If you haven't taught them or you haven't allowed them to spend enough time with you, then you've wasted a little bit of a gift that God has given you. We're responsible for our babies. If they fail, we fail them. When we look at Mary, we see that first she was a virgin. And it was announced in, in Isaiah. That's why she had the faith of God. She had already been written in, about in the book. That's why God had faith in her, because he had already penned her on the pages. She was to be from Nazareth, and, and that was recorded in Isaiah 11. And she would be required to go to Bethlehem at the time when she was due to give birth. That was, that, God wrote that by the hands of Micah. And she was a descendant of David. That's in 2 Sam. This young lady's name was through the pages of time. So when God sent the angel and said, God has favor in you. That's what he was saying. And she wasn't anybody special. She wasn't a queen on the throne. She wasn't a princess. She was just a little peasant from a peasant family. From a low means, a humble means. And God used her. And that's us. We're not all that to, to brag about and get spotlights. And we are humble, aren't we? God's been gracious to us. What we have, we don't deserve it. And we certainly haven't done enough to earn it. 
He's just smiled on us. He's just shown us his grace and his mercy. We all can walk in and walk out. It's his grace and his mercy. And when he gives us an assignment, we should be jumping at it. Not saying how old we are, how tired we are. No. He said, God, if you be for me, it's more than this assignment against me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We have to remember his promises. And so when Mary finally takes her assignment, you know what she says? My soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful. He's thought about me. Of the humble state of his servant. I'm a servant. She said she was a servant from the beginning. She didn't even try to identify herself with her people. She says, I'm a servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me, is what she said. Holy is his name. She knows this God. His mercy extends to those who fear him. She knows the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Anyone who fears God is powerful in his might. To fear God is what he would have us to do. Fear and trembling. And if you, and if you don't know what that means, ask God. He says, if you ask it, I'll give it to you. Fear him. He's to be feared. He's not to be played with. And then she went on to say, his mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. It will not end as long as you fear him. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. She knows this God. This little girl named Mary knows him. No wonder God has given her favor and has written about her on the pages before. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. She know not to be proud. Because she says, he has scattered those who are proud. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. She says, oh, look what God has done. The last will be first. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. She's saying this is being fulfilled, that our ancestors awaited the Messiah, and he's chosen me. I am humbled. He doesn't have to worry about her calling in CNN, CBS, ABC. She doesn't have to worry about trying to write a book before the baby is born. Not this Mary. Uh-uh. She fears this God. Her next task was to go and be with her cousin Elizabeth, who was with child, beyond age and barren. Look at God. He said, I'm going to confirm to you that what I'm saying to you shall come to pass in you and through you. I'm sending you to a woman who's old and barren, and she's six months pregnant. You go to her. In her womb was... John the Baptist. And when Mary stepped into her presence, their babies leaped. John the Baptist leaped. Both of these babies are filled with the Holy Spirit. If there's anything you want your baby to have is the Holy Spirit. When they come out of the womb, lay hands immediately. Find someone that you trust that can if you aren't capable. You want that baby to have God in him. In times like these, most definitely. When I meet people with their babies, I ask, can I lay hands on your baby? I say, I'm a woman of God, and they're eager. Doesn't take long. Just rub them on their little back. I say, God bless this baby. Use this baby and protect this baby to the glory of God in Jesus' name. They don't even hear me praying, but that's what I do. And I have yet to have one of them to cry. They're just as precious as they can be. Your attention, please. Your attention, please. That's the word of God for the people of God. 